be out here for probably about an hour or so. Thought I'd talk a little bit about the latest Federal Reserve speech. You know, everybody seems to think that the Federal Reserve and their monetary policy of money printer go burr is the only reason why we had inflation. A lot of people forget about the supply chain and how there is a whole supply side of the equation when it comes to the establishment of prices, supply versus demand. And in this latest Federal Reserve speech, I will leave a link down in the description, there was a couple of statements in there that really kind of talk about what it is that they are looking for as far as what they need in order to adjust their monetary policies. And I just took a couple of things out of there. There's a lot in that speech and really, um, I probably should have had the whole speech and we should go over the entire thing, but considering I only have an hour or so to talk out here, Getting this little bit of information out and having a discussion about this portion of it is probably going to be pretty good. Um, you know, and I want to thank all the new subscribers who have come to the channel. If you're watching this live for the first time or if you are watching the uploaded version of this, thank you very much for all the subscriptions. It's been quite incredible. I don't think I've ever had so many subscriptions in such a short amount of time. So thank you very much to all the new subscribers. Thank you for being here. Um, but let's talk about this, uh, this speech because it's talking about the up and coming monetary policies, not necessarily talking about the digital currencies or anything like that, but maybe more of like where it is that the Fed is wanting to push those interest rates or what are the, what it is that they're looking for. Now I took these couple of parts out of the, uh, out of the speech. So forgive me if I kind of stumble through it, but it goes something like this. The, uh, however, the pandemic effects uh, reverberated through 2021 and 2022. Inflation surged during the recovery and amid pandemic-induced disruptions to the supply. While demand for goods was boosted by a shift away from in-person services, an overall demand was supported by monetary and fiscal policies. Russia invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 was a further supply shock to the global economy, driving up prices for energy and other commodities. Last uh, and other commodities last June, U.S. inflation hit a peak of seven percent, as measured by the 12-month change in personal consumption expenditures, the PCE index. Now. The main takeaway I get from that section of the speech is that it's all talking about the supply side of things. There was a huge supply disruption. And what I what I really just is just frustrating for me is that they always call it the pandemic induced recession, pandemic induced supply shock, pandemic induced, pandemic induced. It it was a self induced because of the pandemic, right? I mean, it didn't mean that we had to stay home. I mean, they said we had to stay home for health reasons or whatever, but it wasn't like, you know, we didn't have a choice in this matter. The government made a choice to do that. We all could have gone to work and we would not have seen that supply chain breakdown like it did. People say that it might have been a lot worse than what it was, like everybody dying and getting sick or whatever. I'm not saying any of that stuff. What I'm saying is that the pandemic-induced disruption was self-induced because of the pandemic. It wasn't pandemic-induced, right? I mean, we got to call it what it is. So anyway, I mean, I guess everybody has to look at that for what it is. To me, that was a self, self-induced self issue. You know, it's like, oh gosh, we're sick. Here, let me shoot myself in the foot. Bang. Now we can't go to work either. All right, here we go. Um... Okay, so, and continuing on, he has uh, this also, gosh, I'm sorry, I didn't write down who it was, uh, who did the speech, I apologize for that, I'm sorry. All right, but the link is down in the description for you guys. All right, currently, however, supply in the economy continues to be insufficient to meet the still robust demand. Importantly, consumer spending has gained steam this year after slowing late last year. Consumer spending is being supported by robust growth in household real disposable income income amid stronger or amid strong employment growth strong household balance sheets have also supported spending although lower income consuming consumers appear to have mostly exhausted their excess savings very interesting inside of this so now what we have is a, a supply demand imbalance right so what ended up happening was is that when we had this like supply breakdown and so right there at the very the pandemic induced you know 
what do they call it? Pandemic induced disruptions, right? So when we had the pandemic induced disruptions to the supply and that brought down and then they gave everybody a bunch of stimulus and that spiked up here. We had this huge supply in supply versus demand imbalance. Now what they're trying to do is get the demand down to meet the supply, but the supply is kind of falling with it because why would the supplier come back, right? Okay, so what they are kind of going on about here is that the robust income right so as everybody was like not able to go out and or go out and work or whatever all these jobs started being created during the pandemic right all and i got a lot of reasons for it but you know retirees went you know retired early there was a lack of new schooling but really it was the rise of zombie corporations that started a lot of hiring that i feel is the reason why a lot of people started moving up into higher paying jobs now they're saying that was the reason why people are now spending more than they would which does make a lot of sense if you earn more income then you're going to start spending more money and so that's really where they're talking about how the robust demand that or yeah the, the robust demand that we're experiencing right now geez i gotta slow down that we are experiencing right now is due to that wage growth that we had experienced during the pandemic. And he says, but although it appears that the lower wage earners have exhausted their wages, which makes a lot of sense, right? Now, if we think back to some of the things that we have just recently heard, that during the pandemic, the higher wage, the higher income, the wealthy left the bottom portion behind. Like they are now exponentially leaving us like as far as their wealth that they get. And when you have new money pouring into the system, the Cantillon effect has the people at the very end of the line suffering the most. And this is exactly what the Federal Reserve is saying is taking place right now. You know, it's I mean, it's hard to understand these words because they use they say it's so complicated, you know, like in a complicated way. But ultimately, that's what they're getting on at is that, you know, these higher wages that people had earned has, you know, people spending money into the economy. It's one of the reasons why you're not seeing the demand come down to meet the supplies because of that, even if they're tightening up the financial conditions, which they go on to talk about here in just a second. OK, Woo. are you guys following along? <laughs> All right. Here we go. All right. So going forward, I am weighing the implications of a stronger momentum in the economy against potential headwinds from recent developments or from recent developments. Okay. On one hand, if the tighter financial conditions restraining the economy, the appropriate path of the Fed funds rate may be lower than it would be in their absence. That I mean, I read this thing over and over again, trying to figure it out. They word this stuff so in such a way that they make it very complicated for anybody to try and understand. I mean, it's just like, why, why did they do it this way? It's just like, it's beyond me. Let me read it again here. Going forward, I am weighing the implications of a stronger momentum in the economy against potential headwinds from recent developments. On, let's see here, one hand, if the tighter financing, financing conditions restraining the economy the appropriate path at the Fed funds rate may be lower than it would be in their absence. All right. So basically saying that the stronger economy, if it wasn't there, that the Fed funds rate may be more appropriate at a lower level. But because we have this stronger economy taking place within it, that the Fed funds rate has to be higher. However, he goes on to say, on the other hand, if the data uh, show continued strength in the economy, the disinf in disinflation, we may have to work harder. So, again, like the Federal Reserve is looking for what? They're looking for the unemployment to rise. Right? People lose their job. When they lose their job, they're going to be spending less into the economy. It's really, this is the Phillips curve that a lot of people just kind of think doesn't exist anymore. But the Federal Reserve still follows it. And whether or not it actually plays out... That's really what they're looking at. As more people are working, more people get more money, more people go out there, start spending that money into the economy, that starts picking the economy up. And then people are out there chasing for those goods and services or more dollars starts chasing for the goods and services. You start seeing the economy or the prices start to increase, right? Money velocity kind of thing going on. But as people lose their jobs, and they have less money to spend, then they spend less money into the economy, then less transactions start to take place and the slowing down in the economy starts to happen. However, because of the higher wages that we have all earned, that's keeping the economy robust. <sighs> all right, great speech. I'll leave a link down in the description. You guys come to your own conclusions. What you all talking about today? All right, 150 of you, go hit that like button, please. We'll get you, uh, 
we'll get the algorithm to take the video around and get more people up in here. Um, I'll be out here for probably another 40 minutes, 40, 50 minutes or so. I'm going to try and do an hour or so. All right, let's go up to the top, see who's here. Hello from Joplin. Very cool. Very nice, Jeffrey. Thank you for being here. I'm buying all the silver and gold. Very cool. All right, Ronnie. Hi, y'all. Nick, there's. Did I spell something wrong? Oh. <laughs> What's up, UE? Gold, silver, as soon as possible. Hello. Uh, no one-trick ponies. Uh, failing. Let's see here. Failing bullish for all markets because Fed will need to cut and will skip soft landing to go straight to landing as the land of stimmies and NFTs returns. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like a lot of people are talking about the Fed pivot and how quickly they're going to pivot and all that other stuff. I don't think it's going to happen. Even from the recent talks about how robust the economy is. I mean, they're looking for pain, right? They're in pain yet. I mean, I, I mean, there's kind of like, you know, some headlines of some pain. You see these layoffs of these tech companies and stuff like that. But I'm talking like blood in the streets. I want to talk about riots. I'm talking like, you know, people pissed, right? People aren't pissed. They're irritated right now. There's a difference, you know, <laughs> like. People can get really, really mad, and I ain't seen it yet. When that happens, then you'll start seeing things about, like, you know, pivot and, like, can't handle it and stuff. We're a long ways away from that. All right. Uneducated economist, what would you do if your checking account had $200,000? Um, I probably wouldn't let a checking account get to $200,000. Like, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I don't know. Like, that's like not something I probably would have allowed to happen anyway. But if somebody was like, boom, here you go. Here's $200,000. Um, I probably wouldn't be moving really quickly with that. Um, in fact, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't do much, uh, not for a year. Like, I think the next year is going to be incredibly, incredibly difficult. Think about like monetary policies. In, in their input in what they affect the economy, the real economy, like the markets are different, right? People are like, they think the Dow Jones is like the, the, the economy. That's not, that's a, that's a bunch of companies out there. Now it does kind of represent kind of like moves and directions and stuff like that. But it doesn't like, you know, if the, the Dow is going up or down, that doesn't represent the economy. The economy is you and me, the decisions that we make, the businesses that we start, what we do with our money, that that's the economy. That's the real economy out there. <clears throat> so when the federal reserve does their monetary policies, it will impact the markets like right now. They are ready to move. They on every word, every little news, there there's constant change in that. But the actual economy, the real economy, the things that we do, that takes a while. So whatever Fed move is taking place takes a while before it starts to impact the economy, right? So if you're asking me, like, how is it that I need to invest $200,000 right now? I would not participate in markets. I wouldn't participate in investments and stuff like that. I would take that $200,000 personally, me, and I would start expanding on the idea of promoting the uneducated economist and start doing like, you know, more speaking engagements, try to come up with something that would be like a course that I could sell or something like that and expand me. Like I would invest in me personally and whatever happens in the economy happens, but that's like what I would do. Um, if it was for mon monetary, like I'm trying to find a place to put it, that's not like, you know, investing into like the growth of myself or something, then it would, I would wait. I would wait till for about a year because I feel that anything that the federal reserve, even if they were to pivot today would still take about a year before it would start impacting the economy, the real economy, not the markets. Right. So I would wait a year before I'd probably do anything. And then at that point, I would try and find the position in which that I would want to go to. I mean, one of the things that I'm going to be looking for is the spread between the five year, 30 year. When that starts to widen, right, the, the spread between the five year, 30 year, that is Gallons Greenspan's indicator of corporate management's willingness to invest. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I figure if corporate management's willing to invest, then I should be too. So that's kind of like what I would do with $200,000. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. All right. Uh, the golden window is closing soon. 
If it's not CBDC or UBI, it's Russia. Sick of this BS. What are your thoughts on the whole China, Russia, South Africa thing moving away from the petrodollar? We're not going to be using gasoline anyway, right? We're all going to be using electric vehicles, so nobody needs any gas. I don't know. Um, first of all, the the dollar dominance is still so prevalent right now that it is very difficult for me to try and say like the dollar is dead now. Yeah, there are definite moves taking place. When you see moves like this, these are the signs of dollar dominance loss, right? I mean, this is like if they're not doing it in dollars, they're doing it in something else. Dollar loss is dominance inside of that trade. But when you think about it on the grand scale, like the dollar is like there is not even like the close second is so far away from the dollar being like, you know, as far as a reserve currency. It is like it's, it is such a distant second that it's not even like it's not even in the game, really. You know, the dollar is it. There is nothing else out there. And is that going to last? No, not forever, but it's not changing tomorrow. Right. And although there is these other like trades that are happening out there and eventually it will fade away from it. If you're making decisions like now to to deal with that kind of trade, like how far out into the future, is it 20 years, is it five years, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years? How far out into the future does the dollar lose its world reserve currency status? And then if central bank digital currencies get implemented, how do we know that the dollar doesn't secure it, like secure that dominance? We, we don't, right? So like, how do you make that move today? You really can't. I I don't really like I don't really think about how it is that the dollar is going to be losing its world reserve currency status and how it is that I can profit from that if that's your concern you need to get into gold and crypto like Bitcoin and gold right because those are two things that are outside of the dollar and outside of any other currency that is out there but if you really kind of understand how the dollar is ruler of the world right and how king dollar will continue to to strengthen and show its dominance on the world if, if the united states really wanted to just like destroy the nations of the world all they have to do is just start reeling in the irrational exuberance start forcing some pain on the people and the amount of pain that's going to be felt outside of the world would be intense it would be way worse than what we would experience here in the united states so you know like the dollar you know the united states produces a lot of oil so we don't have to worry about buying oil from the rest of the world like we could produce our own oil if we wanted to we could produce our own food that's pretty cool like we could produce more oil and food than we need i mean not saying that it would be a great time for us but i'm just saying we could we could do it china can't right all right uh baller economist <laughs> It wasn't the banksters and their politician puppets faults. Government loves us. Yeah, well, whatever. Um, smash the thumbs up. It's free. Yeah, I appreciate that. 246 of you out there, go ahead and hit that like button. I mean, we're talking smashing the Fed. Let's, let's get this news out there for people to truly understand what's happening. If the numbers are a human made up concept, isn't money and value a made up concept and thus not real? Well, no, it's real. It's real in the sense that it's a promise to pay. So if you don't believe in the in the promise to pay, like the IOU, then yeah, that's it. That's why there's confidence and it's only confidence. It's not backed by a commodity, it's backed by IOU. Somebody else's promise to pay. And that's it. I mean, it's all debt based. So that's why it's so important to have something real in your hand, tangible. Like even if it's cryptocurrencies, that's at least something that's outside of this system. Right? The dollar is a promise to pay. If all debts disappear, government debts, student loan debts, mortgage debts, car loans, everything, all that stuff was gone. There was no more debts. The dollar would cease to exist. There would be no dollars. And we would still owe. That's what's scary about it. We would still owe the interest on it. But the dollars would disappear, simply disappear from the earth, right? And so all dollars are based off of debt. And so therefore, it's all based off of a promise to pay. So therefore, it's an illusion, right? You know, it's just, it's like, you know, a lot of people think that they're in control of their car, right? Think about it like that. A lot of people are cruising down the road, 50 miles an hour. I'm in total control of my car. I've always been in control of my car. The car operates the way that I've always experienced it. And then one day you have a blowout and you lose control of your car. 
did you ever have control of it or was it just the illusion, right? For 50 years, you drove your car without any problems and one day, boom, right? You have a problem, right? Because you never truly had control. You had the illusion of control. Everything inside of your life and everything that you experienced was this idea that you had control, but you never did, right? <laughs> Uh, Jared, if your money isn't real, please buy a bunch of Bitcoin and send it to me. All right. Uh, let's have it, Jared. Okay. Uh, two words. Made in America. I am watching the uploaded version. I'm here from the future. <laughs> All right. Uh, should we consider moving to BRICS Nation? Seems to be the way. No, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, if that works for you. Um, we will all be slaves to the robots. R uh, rethinking about getting my wealth out of Canada and leaving the country for the BRICS Nations. It's all transitory. All right. Lunch Bucket Joe and his misfits got this. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Jody, take all your money and go to Brazil and even better, Africa. If numbers are human made up, you already said that one. All right, for sure, sailboat to Brazil and get out of Canada. Rick's notes will circulate on U.S. soil. All right. Um, you know, you think about that, like... Do you trust Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa? Do you trust those nations? Like, is that like, hey, man, I am so... Like, that's the place I want to put my money. I am totally cool with them. I'm going to take all my wealth, all my hard work, everything that I've ever done here in the United States, I'm going to send it over to Brazil. Right? And then invest in Brazil and Russia and China and South Africa. Right? That's what I'm going to do. In fact, I think the rest of the world is going to do that too. Because there's so much faith and trust and belief and confidence inside of those nations. Right? That's that's what we're saying here. And that, on top of it, like if they are going to take over the dollar, right, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to provide the world with a safe and liquid asset like the U.S. Treasury. That means all those nations are going to have to take on a debt that's bigger than the United States has done. The United States has a debt that's bigger than anybody in the history of the world. That's all, that's very difficult to do, right? Like you're going to take take on that much debt in order to issue out that that safe and liquid asset like the U.S. Treasury. And then you're going to have to provide the world with the actual dollars. Now, how are you going to do that, right? Like the United States is the world's largest consumer because that's the easiest way to get the money out to the rest of the world is to borrow from them and then buy their stuff. And that's really what the United States is, is like a giant pig, right? That just sits there and absorbs and craps out money. It's really strange, you know? <laughs> Uh, and so if the BRICS nations can do that, and then, I mean, then that'll happen. I mean, but I just don't see how they're going to do that yet because there's nobody out there who's even close. No, nah, bro, I'm in the middle of something. Uh, some dude's asking me for a jump. Uh, put this up there and block the sun from cooking my phone. All right. Thumbs up. Uh, keep good work. Well, I appreciate it. You know, I mean... We have, um, let's ask Antio on here, you know, I, I, you know, I try to, you know, come up with, you know, at least my theories on, you know, what it is that's happening. You know, there's so many things out there that people just fall right into this mainstream media news to, to get their information on what's happening. And yeah, that's really where the information is, but you have to look deeper into it. You have to really understand it. I mean, everybody, everybody, like if you asked a hundred people out there, why prices are so high? And everybody's going to say it's because of all the money printing. But hardly anybody will talk to you about the supply side of it, right? Knowing that there is a supply and demand, right? That goes on here. But hardly anybody talks about the supply side of anything. They'll talk about it when it's all, you know, a bunch of ships, you know, stacked up and stuff. But they don't really go on about, like, what this means for monetary policy. Uh, Switching between like and unlike to spam, maybe. <laughs> Good morning from California. <laughs> All right. If you were going to buy rental property, what percentage down payment would you do? Um, I don't look at it like that. I am trying to look at real estate 
from the perspective of the guys who are really doing well with real estate, gentlemen like uh, Matthew, Lumberjack Landlord, and Michael Zuber, one rental at a time, they have a mathematical formula for buying property, right? It's the buy box. You have certain, you know, you take the numbers from the house, you know, the down payment, the cost, the rentals, whatever it is that's going on, you plug it into, into their mathematical formula. With this mathematical formula, at the end of it, it will give you a yield. That yield will tell you whether or not that the property is going to be a, a reasonable purchase for you or not. And in that, we'll have the adjustment for the down payment. It may or may not be the percentage of what it is that, you know, that you might think at the time, but it has to fit within the buy box. And so that's like, I mean, to really understand that you have to follow like Lumberjack Landlord or Mike Zuber, you know, Michael Zuber, one rental at a time. Those, those dudes really understand that they talk about it quite a bit. They talk about, you know, the purchasing of real estate. I personally... I, I mean, I'm keeping my options open out there. Like, I'm not going to deny myself, like, an opportunity if I see it and it presents itself. But it, that's not necessarily, like, the direction that I am moving towards. I, but, you know, I certainly, you know, want to keep my eyes open. Uh, back to Little House on the Prairie. 100%. Chat GPT is illegal in Italy. Italy. They know. Okay. How bad will student loan payments come off, cause and affects things? Uh, come off pause affect. Oh, I'm sorry. Coming off pause affects things. Not long from now, a ton of people will have a payment that they haven't had to factor into expenses for the last 13 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Sounds pretty painful. I mean, they should have been expecting it. I don't know what that's going to do. I mean, I have, I mean, to be honest with you, with this whole student loan thing, it's beyond me how it is that you cannot make payments on it and then still have this like consideration of whether or not it's a viable debt. Like, how is it not defaulted on at this point? Who's holding on to this expecting to get paid? Oh, the government, right. What do they have on their balance sheet? Slap, student loan asset backed securities. If you look at the Fed's balance, or not the Fed, but the United States government's balance sheet, the financial portion of it, like, you know, they got this balance sheet with all these assets on this assets. They got, you know, all the properties and gold and whatever it is that the hell they have. The financial portions, all the debt portions, like the treasure, you know, the bonds that they own. That 50% of that, better than 50% of it is student loans, right? Student loan asset backed securities. They call them slabs. Right? So the government, if they were to just like make those things disappear, you know how bad it would offset their balance sheet? Like it's already they're like, you know, defaulting on the loan by having this massive deficit spending, but then it would get even worse, right? By not having this asset, whatever the hell it is, because people don't pay. If they didn't have that on their balance sheet, right? Their balance sheet would start to fall. There'd be more of an SVB kind of thing. <laughs> So there's, I just don't see how those student loans can go anywhere unless somebody actually just buys them, unless they like take taxpayer money and outright buy them out, you know. Uh, uh, gold, silver, not me. I'm stocking up with food and water. Yeah. Food, bullion, okay. Do you see debt as a good hedge against inflation as long as the interest is low? And cash flowing, absolutely. I mean, that's the that's the Robert Ki you know Robert Kiyosaki way of making money. You know, good debt, use debt, you know, low interest debt to buy a cash flowing asset like you know rental income or something like that. I mean, think about it. It's not your money, and you get to make money. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it looks like Honduras will be taking the mediocrity route with the engineering accomplishments of the future members of the central committee. Wow, 25% of the political, political bureau? <laughs> Known language. Hmm. All right. I don't think we have a real economy anymore. Well, it's, I mean, there's always a real economy. I mean, there's, I mean, but as far as like the obscurity within it, like, you know, how the manipulation that goes along, there's always a real economy. I mean, people are always doing transactions. There's always, you know, buys and sells and production. So. 
But as far as a free market, no, that doesn't exist. All uh, right, I think Bitcoin can still do a bull market even with the Fed still doing what it's doing, even if the Fed don't pivot. Well, I think Bitcoin is definitely on a move. I mean, it's going to, I mean, I, I can see where Bitcoin, gold, and the dollar can all rise together at the same time. And that is something that, you know, most people would just have a hell of a time trying to wrap their head around. But, you know, if you follow like Brent Johnson's milkshake theory kind of thing, I haven't listened to Brent Johnson in quite a while, but he really had it going on with his theory, the milkshake theory, where when there is like mass, when you get to a point where people are like scared and there's mass like paranoia of it like you know they don't war natural disasters economic fall whatever it is they got to run somewhere like they got to go to something and now generally for a long time everybody ran to the u.s dollar that was the safe haven you would go to the u.s dollar u.s treasuries u.s stock market that would be the place that you would go to and so the united states would do quite well during like global turmoil you know and now People are now scared of the dollar. Like they don't, they don't, they get all this news that hyperinflation, whatever, and the dollar is going to go under and then, you know, failure of the United States. So where do you go? Like they're worried about their own sovereign nation. They're worried about the United States. Now the United States is the safe haven. So people are going to go there, but not everybody's going to go there because of this fear that's going on out there. So what they're going to start moving into is they're going to move into gold because that was the only other place to go to. That's like a globally recognized monetary metal there really is outside of all the jurisdictions and outside of all the you know systems that are existing gold is it there's really nothing else that can replace it but now we have these cryptocurrencies like bitcoin that can also serve very similar in that fashion where it can can transition you through a breakdown in the system because it's not part of that system so whether or not it's viable on the end other side of it that's another question you know whether or not bitcoin is but gold would be in my opinion whether they have laws out there that restrict the sale or you know transactions or something that might be another story but the existence of gold in your hand wouldn't change and no matter what happens out there economic wise that that's like it, it's like an anchor to to whatever happens you like let it go you know it can fly over the top of you and you still got your anchor of gold so yeah stock food gear for grid town grid down freedom tools pays off debt food water shelter uh oh i'm burning gas i drill my own will i have to okay what about putting the two hundred thousand dollars into money market or t-bills i mean yeah i mean i guess if you wanted a place to put it you didn't have any other plans to do with the money and you said yeah in one year i'll come back to this and i'll get my money then that's cool like yeah i mean even if you didn't even keep it in there for a year but i have to think like at seven percent or whatever i mean i don't think it's even that high but you know even if you were to get like 10 percent off of it right which is quite a bit you know two hundred thousand dollars ten percent i mean that's what 20 grand i mean that's a lot of money to 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 have at the end of the year but it's two hundred thousand dollars and the chances of you being able to put two hundred thousand dollars towards something that's going to do better than 20 grand i think the potential is there right over the course of the next year I don't know what it is, but I think that, you know, there is a potential for that to happen. If you're looking for the safe haven, I just want my money. I, at the end of the year, I want, I definitely want my $200,000 in a year from now. And if you get a little score off of it for 20 grand, cool, right? But if you're looking for the best opportunity for it, I think there's going to be better opportunities than even a 10% return. Like, I think that there's going to be some massive, massive, like, discounts coming in the course of the next year. Yeah. Blood in the street kind of stuff. All right. Uh, I buy acreage with 50%. North Burn, North Burn, Ontario, unorganized, on sale right now, 30% off. I've been watching last five years. Now I am thinking about buying a sailboat and escaping Canada. <laughs> First day. But China has Russia with unlimited resources. 
China has Russia with unlimited resources. Um, the potential... No, there's not an unlimited resource. There's never such thing as an unlimited resource. They have a potential to a lot of resources. But, uh, the dollar is toast, therefore collapsing the petrodollar. Bonds are just paper, or actually they just data on a computer now. That's right. Bitcoin is secretly the global aerospace defense sector sector's answer to the inevitable rollout of the suppressed free energy technologies and propulsion technologies. Man, that's a cool comment. <laughs> I like that one. Hydrogen fuel technologies. Thank you, man. <laughs> yeah, it's like half barter with money as an intermediary. Bitcoin is a public ledger. The dollar is toast. All right. Stonks go up. Why? Hydrogen fuel technology, ethanol, SOFCs are the future. I'm from the future too. All right. A lot more than USA or Canada. Yeah. Okay. US time is up. Time for new currency every 100 years change. Uh, physical dollar is merely a measly token. Debt is chains in your life. If you're out of debt, none of the brick stuff matters, no? Yeah, I kind of agree. The bricks will not function like the U.S. They will trade in their own currencies. Okay. That's, that's, okay. That's a great, great way to, oops, great way to look at it. Um, because they're going to trade in their own currency. That's cool. I, I agree, right? I mean, that's what they're going to do. But now, what are you going to do when, you know, you go to like Sri Lanka, right? Or if you go someplace else, right, that is in high demand for dollars because they have taken out debts in dollars, right? Everything that they buy is in dollars. Now, yeah, you can go to the BRICS nations and say, okay, well, I got Russia, you know, I got rubles and I got yuan or whatever. And they're like, okay, cool, we accept those. But then you go to Canada and you're like, hey, I want to get some of your oil or grain or, you know, wood forestry products or something like that. And they're like, yeah, we're going to do that deal in dollars, right? Because everybody else that we're dealing with is dealing with dollars. And just because you guys have formed your own little club and are doing your own little, you know, transactions in those the rest of the world is in debt to dollars and that's what they're going to demand so that they can pay off their debts now once they get out of those debts then okay yeah maybe we can start stepping into some BRICS nation currencies or something like that but until they're out of out of US dollar denominated debt they're gonna demand dollars for everything that they do and there's nothing that's gonna change that until they're out of those debts and the more that they try to get out of the debt the more the dollar demand goes up because that's going to strengthen the dollar by pulling dollars literally out of the system. There's no way I don't see the dollar strengthening. Like even the dollar failure, the path to failure is a strengthening dollar. Yeah. And then once it strengthens, it fails, right? I mean, it'll spike right before it'll look the best that it's ever been two weeks before failure. <laughs> All right. Uh, while the BRICS plan backfire. Well, the BRICS, no, I don't think it'll backfire, right? It's not like, I mean, that means that it will fail. It's not a failing thing. It's just, it's a transitioning thing. It's like, it's not like, you. I mean, what is it going to fail? How does it fail if they quit using it, right? But if they just continue to use it, then it's a success. I mean, what's the success? If it continues to grow, I mean, it's successful. It's, to me, like, you know, you look at all the transactions, you got 100 billion million transactions around the world. And, you know, I, I, how many of them are done in dollars? And then how many of them are done in like, you know, some other currency that's outside of dollars? Very few of them. Almost everything is done in dollars. Is that losing its dominance? Sure. How? Why? Where's how? What would that look like? Right. And a lot of people just say, hey, the dollar's failing straight, straight path to failure, like straight down. Like That's not the way it's going to work. If the dollar is going to fail, how does it fail? It's going to fail because people are going to get out of the dollar. How do they get out of the dollar? That means they have to extinguish their debts. How do they extinguish their debts? By getting the dollar, you know? <laughs> uh, for a guy that's 
slings wood, you really understand the Fed speak and economics to the point where a former brown trout brown trout fisher can begin to grasp things. Well, I appreciate it, man. That's the whole point of this channel is to try and get like I was thinking about it. I'm trying to figure out what it is that I'm supposed to be doing, right? Like I have this YouTube channel. I've I mean, I think about doing speaking engagements. I, I don't know what it is that I'm supposed to be doing with this knowledge and ideas and theories and stuff that I have. You know, a lot of people are like, hey, man, thank you for all the stuff that you do. I've learned so much. Now I'm starting to understand, you know, a lot of the a lot of the things that are taking place, especially when it comes from the Federal Reserve. A lot of people try to get their information from politicians. It's the worst place to try and understand economics. Like you can under, like if you understand economics already, then you can go and follow politics and, and try and listen to them as they speak about the economy. Because if you truly understand the economy, you'll listen to politicians and you'll shake your head talk. You know, they're like complete dipshits. They have no idea what the hell they're talking about. I mean, they say stuff that is like completely delusional. I mean, like I, I mean, if I, uh, like I hear someone will speak, and I'm like, how in the hell is it that you're that you're one of the leaders of this nation? Like I don't understand that. Like you, you just got out here and spoke in such a way that I feel dumber for it, right? I mean that it, it's just like I can't believe some of the some of the you know the clownness that's in our in our in our legislation. Uh, um, okay. Okay, uneducated economists, have you ever thought about house hacking at your house? I wouldn't be surprised if you could rent one room in your house for a thousand per month. I did. I've totally thought about that very thing. And, you know, to be honest with you, I am enjoying privacy. Like, I don't know who it is. I mean, if I had a close friend that that I would, I would, you know, trust, but I, to be honest, I just don't want anybody else. Like maybe if I didn't have like a family going on, right. If I didn't have kids and stuff like that, because I, I, it's too personal, right. We got too much going on there. If I was just doing business or something like that, then I would totally do something like that. But, uh, I'm not, I, I mean, if it was the right person, I guess maybe, but you know, it's not something that I'm looking to do. You know? Hey, did I get a super chat? Let's go find that real quick. Yeah, thank you very much, Vinny Grant, for the $9.99. I'm going to be out here for another 15, 20 minutes. So anybody who has not hit that like button, please hit the like button. We'll get a few more people up in here. Vinny, what did you have to say here? I believe we will be moving to a gold-backed digital currency. The U.S. has undisclosed amount of gold and silver, and it will be disclosed when the new currency is announced. Okay. Uh, very interesting because I thought about that very thing and um, um, shoot there was there was a lady that was gonna be running for the Fed and I cannot remember her name right now she was really cool uh, she was like a, a, a big gold bug too how do you do that how do you introduce gold back into the currency and do you really want to do that right because I think about like what happened when we had a gold standard right what happened just before they ended the gold standard they had confiscated all the gold they were like you can't have this this is our this is the money supply so i i get a little nervous when i hear like moving back to a gold standard because moving back to a gold standard may imply that they want all that gold back right and if that's the case then they're going to be pushing for that gold confiscation and that's not going to go over very well with the libertarian libertarian minded folks me being one of them, right? So I, I don't know if that's necessarily going to happen. Well, let's say they just use the existing gold that, that's already out there and not necessarily the private gold that's in our hands. How do they introduce this gold system back into an already fiat currency that's out there because good money chases out bad. Nobody's going to really want the fiat currency if you can have gold currency. So you can't have it as like a dual currency. And so, like, how does that work? How do you implement this gold back into a debt-based currency, right? Well, I could see it, like, maybe through treasury issuance. Like, maybe there are so many treasuries that, you know, like, you know, 10-year treasuries that are issued out 
with a gold backing to it like you know you can buy this and at the end of the you know maturity of it it would pay a certain amount of ounces of gold or you know the dollar equivalent or something like that and then you could probably introduce like u.s treasuries back into a gold standard and then you know slowly just kind of work your way throughout you know and getting through the fiat currency i think that that would end up being very cumbersome in in I, I, I'm, it's hard to say like how that would flow. Like, cause to me, like more people would be more interested in the U S treasuries that are gold back. And then therefore they would have a premium to it. And then there would be two, two types of treasuries out there. And then like, again, that would start creating a market that's really obscured. So I don't know, like, I, I, I don't know exactly how introducing a gold standard back to the united states would would work without like a complete utter collapse like if we had a collapse of the system and everybody lost everything they had then we could reintroduce a gold standard right back into it and then everybody could take off using the gold standard instead of the the old nasty fiat yeah all right how much time do i have okay another 15 minutes you guys, so many comments. I was going to try and read through all of them, but I don't know if I can. Let me go back up here a little ways. Uh, uh, let's see here. Okay, BRICS. Western countries own a whole lot more gold in at least the same amount of commodities and resources and knowledge. To extract them is not even comparable. Yeah, and, you know, really, like, I think about it from, like, I think about it more of, like, the Cantillon effect. You know, you have to really think about how the new money comes into the system where that new money comes from and why it gets introduced how it fails right the, all this all this stuff is a process to it and it's not like really necessarily a decision like a group of men are going to get together and say okay this is the way we're going to do this i mean it is the way that it's done but they're more following like where it's going right where the manufacturing where the money is flowing where the new money comes from and that's the direction they follow and they you know they take the best advantage of that situation as they can and they don't make it like you know obvious to people but you think about like the manufacturing base of the united states back in like the 50s 60s right we were a manufacturing powerhouse think about that for just a second right how much money do you make when you can produce and sell a lot right and if you're producing and selling and pushing it out to the rest of the world and they're sending you a bunch of money and then you take that money and you lend it back out how awesome is that for you Right. I mean, that is like I'm producing a bunch of stuff and the profit that I get from it, I'm lending it out. And the money that I get back is making me ever more powerful. Right. What happens to your standard of living? Okay. You start to increase your standard of living. You're right. You're going to buy new stuff. You're going to buy better things. You're going to enjoy the luxuries of life. Okay. And that is the problem right there. Okay? The moment that you start going into luxuries is the moment that the whole system begins to break down. Because what it does is it drives a wedge between the rich and the poor. And the people who have first access to the money, who are enjoying that money, who are enjoying the luxuries, they get to buy that stuff at face value. And as they buy it at face value, what that does is it makes it less available for the people at the bottom of the line because there's more people who have it at the upper end. They're getting the new money. They're buying the stuff at face value, right? So the people at the bottom end of the line, they end up getting further and further away because they're suffering without wage increases, but they have to deal with the higher prices or the unavailable items that are out there because they're getting consumed by the people who have first access to the money. This is the problem right here, right? What ends up happening is, is that it drives the manufacturing out of that location. Now, it happened to be in the United States. As they're increasing the amount of luxuries, they start importing more and more foreign production. The more foreign production that starts to come in, it starts driving out ever-increasing amounts of domestic manufacturing. All that domestic manufacturing starts transferring over to the place that's a manufacturing powerhouse, like China, right? So China starts to grow, and they start to become the manufacturer of everything as we lose our manufacturing capabilities, but we have the new money still pouring in. You see? As the new money continues to pour in from all over the world, they're lending us money. We're borrowing it, right? We're selling treasuries to the world, the safe and liquid asset, right? The world reserve currency. And so people are sending us all their, all their hard work and effort and time and energy. And then they send us all their stuff. And we're sitting over here going, damn, 
We don't have to do shit. All right. And they, they, we, they lend us money and then they send us their stuff. Right. How long can that last for? Right. Because now over in China, their manufactured powerhouse, they're enjoying their standard of living so much so that they're having the same issues that we're having as their birth rates are falling. Because that's what ends up happening to people who have an increase in their standard of living is they don't want to deteriorate that standard of living with kids. So they don't have kids and they start focusing in on advancing their money and their the things that they have, their luxuries of life. It's really a strange concept. People think that if you have money, you would have kids, but that's not the way it works. I mean, Cantillon's explains it quite well and just look out there in the world. Third world countries that suffer with in poverty have a lot of kids, have a lot of fertility happening. In Western nations, it doesn't. And this is the te deterioration that begins to take place. So now China has this manufacturing taking place. Their birth rate is falling. Their standard of living is increasing. And there are people who are looking at manufacturing in China going, you know, not the greatest over here, right? It's not the greatest in China. We're starting to look over there at Vietnam. We're starting to look over there at India. You know, these are places that are a little bit better opportunities to, to manufacture. And China is going to be like, well, you know, we got all this stuff that we export to the rest of the world. And we got a lot of new money coming in. We're going to, like, try and keep a hold of that, right? And how do you do that? By trying to take over the dominance of the world. And this is what we're experiencing, right? I mean, it's... It's pretty easy, right? It's pretty easy to understand. <laughs> Did I get another super chat down there? Uh, hey, thank you very much, Robert Shields Jr. for the four ninety nine. Do we know what percentage of global trade is in bricks versus U.S.? Maybe it's very small. I don't know what it is today, but it, if I remember right, it was something like the dollar dominance was quite large. It has dropped dramatically. It's something like, I don't know... I, I'm going to pull this number just because it seems reasonable to me from the things that I remember, but it was like 65% where like the Euro was like 10% or something like that. Now, again, I could be really far off on those numbers, but then like the BRICS nations aren't even like, like the 1% or something. They're not even nothing. At least that's from what I understand. Now I could be completely wrong on that. And you know, again, I haven't studied up on this in the last, you know, six months to, you know, get the numbers accurate. But I, I think it would be something fairly similar to that. Good God, people that believe in gold as money need to stop their stupidity. Why? Whoa, man. 5,000 years of history is money and you think that's stupid? All right. Hold on. Let's maybe, maybe you got more to say. Hold on. All right. 800 military bases... That Uncle Sam has around the world will kill any gold money. Muammar Gaddafi is the perfect example. Uh, yeah, I guess you do have a, you do have a point. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, I can't argue with that one. Right? Because <laughs> you're right. I mean, if anybody decides that they're going to do anything outside of what the United States is approving of, they will get utterly smashed for it. That's why this whole Ukraine thing just irks me to something awful, you know, it's because anything that's happening out there military-wise is being allowed to happen. I mean, period, you know. Um, I know a lot of people might argue with that, whatever. I mean, that's my belief then. Um, what do we got? Okay, I got another seven minutes, guys. 10% guaranteed on 200000 is no-brainer. You just said wait a year. Come on, UE. Love the show. Okay. Well, what happens in six months if you find a better deal out there and you have your money tied up and you only had an opportunity to get it for a couple of days? Right? Then what? That, I mean, that's the type of opportunity that I'm thinking is coming because there's going to be massive pain coming to the people. And when they get massive pain, they get they get very eager to get the cash to get out of some of those assets and they will start selling toys off like you wouldn't believe i mean if if a 10 percent for two hundred thousand dollars is a no-brainer it really is right that's a pretty goddamn good return right twenty thousand dollars over the course of a year but again all i have to say is is that we're going into a crisis right now, if this was just an everyday average, you know, year or whatever, and you didn't think about it, like, yeah, right? I mean, 10%, that is a damn good no-brainer, right? But we're not, go we're going into crisis. We're going into massive possibilities here, big-time opportunities. I'm not, I'm, like, I, I'm saying, okay, yeah, $20,000 is a lot of money, right? I mean, I would hate to miss out on that opportunity, but I would hate to miss out on a really good one. 
you know, like a really good opportunity. And that's all I'm saying, right? That's all I guess I'm getting at. And besides, what I say I do with $200,000? I put it back into myself. I, you know, I mean, that's what I would truly invest in. Uh, Judy Shelton, is that her name? Yeah, that was it. See, that lady, she should have been, she should have worked for the Fed, right? She should have been part of the Fed. I would have been much happier with the Federal Reserve if she was there. All right. Expect the unexpected. 99% of the people believe the U.S. dollar won't be majorly affected the next events, but I'm ready if it is, if it is and will benefit greatly. If I'm right, won't really lose if I'm wrong. Yeah. Inflation going to plummet here. Uh, a skilled craftsman can become rich building luxury homes, though. Yeah. Gold and silver above industrial value is... is fo what are you trying to say there? Foyet? <laughs> fiat? I don't know. <laughs> is fiat? I don't know. Anyway. Uh, I guess you're trying to say fiat, maybe. Petrodollar dies September 11, 2001. It's the debt-based, military-backed euro-dollar system now that will oops, break global economy and result in decoupling like dollar and gold in 1971. Temporary, right? Now we'll find out here. I mean, I don't know. Like, is... Is, is dollar... I mean, is if oil is the only commodity out there, if it was backed by a currency, would cause it to be the world reserve currency? Like, I mean, if they decided, like, whatever nations, whatever the entire world gets together and decide that, you know, all oil will be traded in yuan, would it guarantee that that would be the world reserve currency after that? Like, how, did the, how does that happen? How does, how does the world come to that conclusion that everything is going to start trading in in yuan, right? It's because they have to start writing contracts in that, and it has to grow into that system, and that's really where like you see it happening here, right? And so people get they see the evidence of it, and then they think, okay, that's it, it's it's taken place. What a lot of people don't realize is that back in the late seventies, that dollars dollar did not. United States Treasury wrote U.S. Treasuries denominated in German marks and Swiss francs, right? That's how bad the dollar lost its, like, you know, like, its confidence. People were like, like, they didn't even want, they didn't, like, the United States could not even, like, sell their own debt in dollars. They had to sell their debt in a foreign currency. That's how bad it was, right? So... To think that, you know, the dollar has lost its confidence at one time and can't get it back or there's things that will happen within the nation or changes to, you know, to the belief structure or the system that can't keep the dollar going. I mean, I wouldn't fall for it. It's, just, it's not necessarily a one-way path, right? Now, there was a lot of issues taking place back then that, that is not the same that it is today. I mean, you know, you had to think, we just came off of a gold standard and everybody was like trying to figure out what the hell this global fiat currency standard thing was going to look like. You yeah. know, so there was a lot of differences between then and now, but... Uh, did I get another suit? I did. Thank you very much. What is this? Ingmar? Thank you very much for the... I'm not sure what that is, but for the coffee? Thank you very much, sir. I will definitely buy a coffee with it. All right. Top Ramen is the best hedge for inflation. Hey, Top Ramen's great, man. There's, you know, I have taken Top Ramen and dressed that stuff up and made it, like, really good. You know, that little pile of noodles is, like, has been a staple in just about everybody's house who has ever had to, like, work for paycheck to paycheck. You know what, you know, what you can do with some ramen, you know? <laughs> All right. Um, is this the first time in history there is a dual reserve currency? It's not a reserve currency. Bricks versus dollars. So as neither side can fully restrict or deny funds from any country. Wow. Ingmar, inflation must be really impacting coffee. Well, I, I don't know what the what SEK, where is that from? Um, I don't know, but uh, according to my little signal up here, it's probably about $10 worth, which I really appreciate, brother. 
All right. If you value your life, dump the ramen. Oh, hell no. All right. Got to keep that stuff around in case of bad times. Bartering tool, you know? I mean, got to have ramen around. And I agree, it's not it's not good for you. Don't eat it. But yeah, definitely have it around. Not even UE can buy historical trade charts for USD on September 11th, 2001. But we can buy charts from another day for the past hundred years. Okay. Um... Sweden, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Thank you very much, Ingmar. Uh, no more petrodollar or fiat dollars. Do you invest in gold? Um, I, I don't invest in gold. I buy gold as an insurance policy. And in fact, I don't even buy gold. I buy silver, right? I'm more of a, of a silver guy. All right. Will the dollar go up to record numbers? I believe it. Well, I believe it will just before it fails. Like just before the dollar is lost its lost its dominance, lost its use, lost its worthiness, or whatever, you will see it skyrocket. You will see the dollar become more valuable than anybody could have ever imagined, and you will see a lot of people get hurt by that because they're going to try and get into the dollar, which is going to be the wrong move because it's going to fail, and then it'll all be over. So, yeah, I see the dollar getting much, much, much stronger before it ever fails. And that's the reason why, like, a lot of people who say you got to get out of the dollar now because it's going to go into this hyperinflation, I, 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 I don't think it will. Like, I don't see it going into a hyperinflation scenario so long as it's still the world reserve currency because the rest of the world is, do is demanding dollars, right? Now, the once that's over and the world doesn't demand it anymore and there's less contracts being issued in dollars and those contracts are actually shrinking around the world and the people who have dollars are trying to figure out what they need to do with them and they're just sending it back to the United States, then we would see the hyperinflation start to take place. As the confidence in the dollar erodes and people are trying to get out of the dollars and they're sending those dollars back to the United States and we get overwhelmed with all these dollars, right? That's, that's when I see the hyperinflation happening. Uh, can you drop the dollar? Uh, uh, petrodollar crashed already on September 11th, so every calling for its collapse doesn't know. Why silver over gold? Um, well, there's a couple of reasons why silver over gold. For one, it's incredibly undervalued to gold, right? So when you think about it, they pulled gold out of the ground, gold to silver, it's like a 10 to 1 ratio, right? Or something-ish. They pull 10 ounces of silver for every 1 ounce of gold. But I don't even know, what is it on the market right now? I mean, it's like, I don't know, 80, 80 to the 100, I don't know, 90 something. What is the ratio? You guys figure it out for me real quick right now. The ratio from silver to gold right now, it's like extreme. It's like 80 to 1 or something like that. So for every ounce of gold, you could buy 80 ounces of silver with it. So the ratio from pulling it out of the ground is not even comparable to what it sells for on the market, right? And then when you think about it again, if you were to pull the 50% that generally goes to industrial use, which will never make it to bullion form for us investors to buy, investors, right? Um, for us to buy, well then, now that ratio coming out of the ground for investment purposes is like five to one, right? And here it trades on the market at 80 to one. All right, so that's another reason why I think about it. Well, let's take it back to like historical prices, right? Silver had peaked out at $50 an ounce back in the early 80s. It hit pretty close to $50 an ounce in 2011. And right now, it's trading at less than 50% of its all-time high. Can you find anything? I mean, I guess maybe a barrel of oil is kind of close to about 50%, but really there's very few things out there right now that are at 50% of their all-time high, all right? But silver is one of them. Now, as a monetary metal, as an insurance policy, I look for things that are gonna have very little downside risk. Right. And so when you think about like the ratio, the five to one ratio to gold and the 81 it sells for on the market, the downward like, you know, that downward possibility for silver is is not 
it's not that prevalent. It's very limited, right? So that's another reason why I think about it. Now, on top of all this, right? Let's think about like how much production there is of silver in the world, right? It's like I don't know, it's 900 million ounces if I got that right. Am I right on that? Um, 900 million ounces or so. Now you think about it. 900 million ounces of silver that is produced every year. If every single American went out there and, you know, 50% of that has gone to industrial purposes, right? So already, like, you know, you only have like 450 million ounces out there to play around with in production, you know, for, for investment purposes. So now we think about this for just a minute, right? 900 million ounces out there. There's like 365, what, million Americans. Okay, if every American decided that they were going to go out there and buy just two ounces of silver, three, right? Two ounces of silver, it would pretty much eat up the entire world production of silver. Just buying two ounces per person. I mean, we're not talking like Canada, Mexico, Russia, China, India, all the rest of the places around the world who would want to buy silver. If everybody around the world decided that they were just going to go and get their hands on just one ounce of silver, it would be gone right? Gone. There is very little silver out there to be had. And now you think about how, how demand, how demanding our life is when it comes to silver, right? The silver production, our cell phones, medical equipment, the, the life we live, it is from, from what I understand, silver is the second most vital commodity to our life next to oil, right? If we, if we did not have silver, our way of life would end. We would not have the communications, the computers, the, all the technologies that we are using. All this stuff would cease to exist. Silver is that vital of a commodity. I mean, am I, have I sold you on silver yet? <laughs> you know? All right. Sounds like an excellent gift for all occasions. I, absolutely. Forget silver. I will hold that metal in trust for you. Invest in crack coin. <laughs> yeah, uh, the chief finance officer is a good clown this time, promise. Don't focus on production. Copper worth more than gold. King Copper. Hey, I, well, I tell you what. I work a retail, right? I work retail. I stand at a till and I sell two by fours for a living. So, I mean, people literally hand me cash. I look through the tills at work and I pull out all the copper coins. Like I can, I, I, cause they have a different color to them. So I can see when the copper pennies are in there and I swap out all the copper for the zinc and I bring home pounds of copper, literally. Like I, I, you know, I have a little cup on my desk that I throw the, the copper pennies into and when I fill it up, I take it home. The, I mean, I, I am not opposed to, you know, picking up pennies off the ground. All money flows towards me. That's the way I feel like, you know. And no matter how I do it, if I can switch a zinc penny out for a copper penny, a zinc penny is worth less than a penny. A copper penny is worth almost two and a half cents. Like, why wouldn't you do that? Like, I mean, it's easy to do. It's right there. Bang. Like, I did it, you know. <laughs> AUE, have you used chat? No. Um, in my opinion, this is going to take millions of jobs, sales, marketing, PR, advertising, yeah, I mean, I agree. But the thing is, is like, I don't, I don't look at these things as scary. Like, I don't see them. Like, everybody's like, look at all these fearful things that can happen from it. And it's like, dang, yeah, that is pretty fearful. And there's already like, you know, some, like I was reading some article about some guy, like, I don't know. I just read the headline. I didn't actually read the article, but somebody who committed suicide over conversing with an AI chat thing. I mean, I'm like, what in the world? Like, what is this world coming to, right? You know, a computer can convince somebody to do something like that. Um, it shows really the breakdown of society. But I think about it a lot like, like anytime technology gets introduced, it's fearful. And people think about how it's going to deteriorate society and all that. I, I think about it a lot like, you know, the telephone operators, right? When they went from, go, you know, going from having warehouses full of people like doing switchboard operators to go into digital whatever, you know, however they do the communications now and they took all these like computer operators away or these uh, phone operators away. 
they said that then, like, these people aren't going to have any jobs, they're going to be masked, like, you know, unemployment and all kinds of crazy, you know, horrible things are going to happen to the economy because of it. But really what ended up happening is that a lot of women ended up going off and pursuing things that they really should have been doing with their life instead of, like, working switchboards, right? That's really what ended up happening. And so when I think about, like, new technologies being introduced, it doesn't take away from you it enhances your life and it frees you up to go and actually pursue the things that you really should have been doing with your life that's what it does and so I, to me it's not a scary thing to me i mean the scary thing is like what happened to that dude who like you know was depressed and ended up chatting with one of these things and going on with that but like the reality of the situation is that anything that brings convenience to your life is wealth food conveniences pleasures of life right that's cantillon's you know description of wealth and anytime you ever have any kind of convenience brought to you, that's, that's wealth. And that's what really what we're, we're going to find going into the future. Is it scary? Yeah, you know, it's damn scary because it's so new and strange and, you know, changing to society and stuff like that. But, you know, if it's something that you fear, it's going to be a fearful thing and it's going to be a negative for you. All right, let's cruise down here a little ways. Oh, the time is now. Bitcoin, 50% below all-time high. Well, Bitcoin don't count. I mean, well, I, I guess I, should, I shouldn't have asked, right? <laughs> I mean, that's true. Um, you're right, Bitcoin, 50%. Uh, um, our dark emperor says it will be different this time. Press yeah, whatever. Different? Yeah. I mean, I guess, I mean, anytime anybody says it'll be different, I don't think so. It'll be different in, like, a lot of ways, you know, because, you know of new technologies that come in that make things different. But the, you know, the underlying economic, you know, powers that are under there, like, you know, the things that you read in like the Cantillon essay, those things won't change. I mean, the flow of money and what happens, that that doesn't change, you know, like new money flows in, dive into luxuries, you know, the exporting of, you know, manufacturing jobs, all that stuff will continue. Uh, just give me the codes. Silver should be $200, $300 an ounce. Yeah. All right. There's a cryptocurrency that is AI resistant. It's called Idina. Bitcoin will pause briefly at 100000 in 2024. All right. Do you believe electric cars will make combustion engines obsolete? Um... Well, yeah, it's already starting to happen. I mean, everything's going to electric now. I mean, eventually you're going to find where con internal combustion engines will, will be very much not in use like it once was. I mean, you're going to find that it's going to be used. I mean, there's too many of it out there. There's too much of it, uh, you know, of it occurring out there. But everything you see is moving to, to electric. I mean, I'm just amazed by the amount of cordless power tools that are now available. And, you know, when they, I've been in the industry a long time. When it came to construction and the power, when the, when the cordless tools came out, they were very bulky, heavy. They didn't last very long. You know, they were kind of like a neat, a neat feature to have, but really it wasn't that, that prevalent out there. It wasn't until like, you know, just recently with the lithium batteries and the more power and stuff like that, that it really started to, uh, to increase their use. All right, guys, uh, my family just showed up. We're taking off for a birthday party. It has been super awesome hanging out with you. We got 335 of you had joined the video. 210 thumbs up. Thank you very much for doing the thumbs up. I, uh, I really appreciate that. It helps get the video spread around there. $24.60 in Super Chats. You guys are always so very supportive of the channel. I always appreciate that because without you, I don't know what I would do because this whole new life for me is because of everything that you guys have helped me accomplish with all the support that you have done through this channel i mean i cannot thank you enough so you know we're still growing we're still trying and we're still figuring this stuff out uneducated economists you guys let me know